Welcome to Meta Motivations. My name is Maria Deanson, and I'm the strategy manager at Imperial Tech Foresight. I will be your host for this afternoon. This is the first of a series of three sessions exploring the theme of intentional creations. The topic will look at how we can reframe technology and scientific breakthrough for good and create a course of positive technological futures. As Imperial College London, this is close to our hearts since we constantly work towards applying scientific discovery for the benefit of society. And in these sessions, we'll explore the future through the lens of cutting edge research insight from world leading academics across the college. It is a broad theme and we will cover areas such as new material prosthetics, building self-governing fairness in AI to battery circularity. And we will run these Thursdays to inspire you and others to think differently about the future. The event is brought to you by Imperial Business Partners, a bespoke executive platform for global industry clients who want to have an accelerated access to Imperial College London and our visionary ecosystem of startups and academics. As a platform, it gives its clients a unique approach to problem solving for research-driven industries, giving you access to leading expertise, talent, facilities, as well as insights like today. But for today, it's all about meta motivations. And in the session, the academics and startups will share insights on how to build responsiveness into fragile systems, how we connect with nature and conserve the services they give us, and how we can ethically build and manage organizations. Themes that really look at how to mitigate against some of the uncertainties we are facing today. I really want to introduce you to the first speaker of the day, who is Dr. Christina banks Leite, a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Natural Sciences. She's actually currently doing this presentation from Brazil, where she works on creating powerful change in the rainforest conservation. And she will today talk about her vision for the next 20 years and her successful work in the Atlantic Forest. I would now like to pass you on to Christina, who will share her work on rewilding our futures. Well, thank you, Maria, for your introduction. And, um, and well, so I'm Christina, and today I'm going to talk to you about how my research resulted in tangible changes in one of the most threatened areas of the world, the Atlantic Forest of Brazil, and also how it can be used to change other parts of the world too. So this is a picture of me, the age of nine, in my parents' farm in Brazil. I was born and raised here, and um, this bit of forest that you see in the back of this image is a very degraded version of the beautiful Atlantic forest, which is a tropical forest that runs along the, the coast of Brazil. As I was growing up, there were, uh, I saw firsthand how environmental degradation could impact the lives of people and, and the species around us. And I made a decision to commit my life to help changing that. And back then, never in my wildest dream, I would have imagined that in 2017, there would be two pieces of legislation being passed into Brazilian law that was a result from research that I had done to enable the reforestation of the Atlantic Forest. So what happened between my nine-year-old self and 2017 is the story that I'm going to talk right now. So this photo was taken in the Amazon by a colleague of mine. And this is an image of forests worldwide that we're getting all too used to seeing in the news now. So we know that the way that we're modifying the world is leading species to extinction, and we, we know that we have to do something to stop this extinction. The problem is that every time the importance of, of saving species is raised, someone somewhere will raise issues of costs to the economy. And, and it's understandable. How can we send millions of people into poverty by denying them their own rights to, to use the, the land as they wish? But, well, we know now that the trade-off between conservation and economy doesn't need to exist. We can aim for a win-win situation where farmers produce the same or higher levels of food and the environment is maintained. But to reach this ideal situation, we need to change our mindset. And changing our mindset isn't easy. Um, some say that we're now living in the Anthropocene, which is the era of human domination over the world. But we've had enough of being chased we, we eradicated crippling diseases such as polio and smallpox, and, and we, we are at a stage now where obesity is becoming a bigger issue than famine. The world is ours, and many of us think that we can continue to change the world or change the environment as we wish. 
But the reason why it's crucial that we change our mindset, it's because whether we want it or not, we rely on natural system around us. And we currently take for granted all of the services that nature provides for us. For example, a third of all crops are pollinated by animals. And because it's so difficult to, to cost these services, we often think that they're free, but they're really not. So in Brazil alone, uh, pollinators contribute with 12 billion US dollars per year to the economy. And because we change the environment so much, insect populations are going down and pollinators in particular are going extinct around the world. So we are going to have to pick up that bill on pollination. And when I mean we, I mean our generation and our children's generation. And the way we're changing the world doesn't only lead to a decrease in species that we like, it also leads to an increase in species that we don't like, such as Lyme disease, for instance. And it also puts us at much greater con uh, risk of contact with, with new diseases such as COVID-19. And of all the ways that we're modifying our planet, deforestation and habitat fragmentation are the main drivers of biodiversity loss. It's been estimated that a million species are going extinct just because of habitat loss. And in fact, many say that we're now experiencing the sixth mass extinction, which is a similar event to when the dinosaurs went extinct, but now we have more species going extinct at a faster rate. So for our own sake, we need to change our mindset that we can modify the world as we like and we need to stop this loss of species. So what are the ways that we can protect biodiversity? Um, the most usual way people think about this is through uh, protected areas, which have a crucial role in maintaining biodiversity across the world. And, and as here is a good example of a, a protected area in the Amazon. However, in, in populous places like the Atlantic Forest or Europe, for instance, most areas have already been heavily modified and they are quite economically active. So we need to find alternatives to preserve biodiversity. And one such alternative is to preserve biodiversity within farmland. So the main advantages uh, with this approach is that farmers will benefit from the spillover of services that species provide. So such as pest production, uh, sorry, pest production, pe pest predation, and a cooler microclimate and um, protection of bodies of water. We don't want these services to be tucked away inside protected areas. We want people to benefit from them. It's really important. But obviously there are disadvantages as well. And the main one is that it's costly. And in the Atlantic forest, um, farmers get an average profit of 500 US dollars per year per hectare. And this is more than the Brazilian minimum wage. So it's understandable that many of them would be reluctant in engage with conservation. But there are a few ways when we can direct payments to farmers who, to set aside land for conservation or manage their land in a more sustainable way. So um, there are conservation schemes such as payment for ecosystem services, which direct payments with this specific purpose of increasing um, water quality or carbon stocks, for instance. And there are government schemes such as the Pillar 2 of the Common Agricultural Policy, which encourage best practices in farming. But there are ways around it. But even if we have the money, so uh, how much habitat do we need to set aside for conservation? And can we get away with strips of forest like this? Or do we need a much larger piece of forest like this one, for instance? And this question is really crucial because if we set aside too much, too much, for, uh, too much habitat, then it becomes too expensive. And if we set too little, then we're not going to be saving species. And this question has been asked by many different groups. And until we published our work, there wasn't much of a consensus around. And this is usually because of one or two problems. Um, so A, because people often focus on one species or a group of species, or because they only focus on a total number of species. And two, or, or B, because they um, often measure the size and isolation of habitat fragments as if they were islands. And I could talk for over an hour with all the problems with this approach. So we created a novel approach we measured the integrity of the environment. And this is basically the green similarity in uh, the species present in farmland when compared to protected areas. 
So for instance, if we, let's just, let's pretend that this is a protected area and with these species. And if this is the case, then this fragment here would have a higher integrity than this other fragment here. And this is because despite the fact that they both have the same numbers of species, the larger fragment of forest has species that are more similar to the ones that we find in protected areas. And we measure the proportion of habitat cover in the region around the site where we collect our data. And we chose to address these questions in the Atlantic Forest, which is a biome with a very large number of endemic species. And so these are the species that only occur in this region and nowhere else in the world. So for instance, we have over 8,000 endemic species. We have over 100 endemic birds. So these species um, cannot be found anywhere else. And the Atlantic Forest was once the, the second largest tropical forest within South America. But now there's about uh, 130 million people living within this region and, um, and collectively they're responsible for 70% of Brazil's GDP. So this area now has been reduced to less than 12% of its original extent. And although this deforestation has been ongoing since the, um, the European settlers arrived in Brazil, uh, we're now reaching a stage where there is a real risk of uh, committing uh, um, that thousands of species would be going extinct unless we do something about this. So we collected data on mammals, birds and amphibians for six years and we calculated how the integrity of the vertebrate community changes with forest cover and we showed that the minimum amount of forest required to preserve biodiversity in the Atlantic forest is 30 percent. And we show that biodiversity is not dramatically altered until 30% of forest cover, but the species found below this threshold are completely different to those found above the threshold. And in the study, we also show that um, the services they provide are two completely different. Right, so we need 30% of cover, uh, but the Atlantic forest is a lot less than that. So what do we do? Well, first we protect everything we have standing. This is non-negotiable. Um, but we also need to increase the amount of forest if we want to prevent future species extinction. We can't reforest everything, that would be um, unrealistic and that would be unfeasible. So we created a prioritization framework that uh, maximizes value for money. And we then calculated how much it would cost to reforest these priority areas in the Atlantic forest. And our results show that with 200 million US dollars per year, which sounds like a lot, but it's equivalent to six and a half percent of what Brazil spends on agricultural subsidies. It would be possible to direct payments to farmers who are willing to increase the amount of set aside within their land. And we can focus restoration on areas with low agricultural yield as well. So if we create subsides in priority areas, that would incur in the loss of only 0.61% of the agricultural GDP produced in this municipality. And payments would be directed at the very same people who would spare their land for conservation. And on the top of that, we also get an increase in biodiversity and ecosystem function to levels that are equivalent to those uh, seen in protected areas. I'm going to be honest with you, uh, when I set out to do the study, I wasn't expecting to find such a clear and simple message that we need 30% of forest mm -hmm. cover and it would actually be feasible and cheap to, to uh, reach this. So the fact that we found such a clear message meant that um, our results were then used to inform two new environmental resolutions in Brazil. So one was just for the state of Sao Paulo, where the aim was to improve water security for the 43 million people who live in this state. The other one was at the federal level and, um, and our 30% threshold was used alongside socioeconomic layers to select areas where reforestation should be prioritized and also restore these areas back to 30%. So with the help of government and NGOs and industry and universities, this policy will have an impact on restoration, increasing the amount of forest cover by 700 thousand hectares by the end of this year, 2020. But to put this into context, the UK has pledged in its 25-year plan for the environment to increase 180,000 hectares of woodlands by 2042. So um, the, the, the impact that this has had is quite dramatic. 
Um, but now let's look at the rest of the world. I mean, there isn't anything specific about the Atlantic Forest or Brazil that makes it unique. We can find this threshold, this minimum amount of habitat required to preserve biodiversity for every habitat in the world. And this is important. We can't supply our results to other parts of the globe. We, we certainly wouldn't need 30% in all places. In, in fact, in another study also published in Science, and if you want to hear more about it, you can um, look up a, a article about fractured forests in the New York Times. We show that biodiversity in tropical forests are a lot more sensitive to deforestation than those in the temperate zones. And it's most likely that in Europe, we would need less habitat to, re to preserve biodiversity than in the Amazon, for instance, in the Amazon would need a lot more. And a while back in the day, we had to spend months and years in the field collecting data. Now we can use um, advances in acoustic modeling, uh, sorry, acoustic monitoring and machine learning and remote sensing to obtain information on thousands of species across hundreds of sites at a fraction of the time and cost that we, we, we used to do. So with this new technology, we can collect data that we always dreamed of, such as telling whether species are stressed or not. So we're using right now uh, machine learning on acoustic data uh, collected over uh, on over 300 sites in Costa Rica. And we can not only tell where spider monkeys are found, but we can also develop a model where we could detect the different calls. And we, could, we can detect also whether they are more stressed in certain environments. And this would allow us to detect tipping points before there is even a population collapse. And this is very important because of the highly threatened species. So my vision for the next 10 years is that we can find this threshold for all biomes in the world. This is, this is feasible. It's hard work, but can be done. We have theoretical expectations of how this, this threshold should vary from place to place, and we can use data to test these models. And the reason why this is so important is because Currently, many countries around the world, such as England, for instance, are using the approach of restoring nature to a bigger and more connected state. But what does that even mean? I mean, this is a great approach, but we don't know exactly what that means. Is, do we need a, a one square kilometer or do we need 100 square kilometers? And, and well, how do we define connected? What's, what's connected and what's not? Um, it would be a lot easier if we could say we need 10% forest cover, we need 20% of forest cover, or habitat cover, sorry. And then we can discuss which areas within a country are in most desperate need for restoration. There's certainly no money or personnel to act on all places at the same time. So we need to prioritize areas. And once that is done, we can use a bottom-up approach where we define priority area within prior priority areas, which soils or terrains have lower productivity and reverting them to a native habitat state would incur in a minimal loss to, to the economy. And we can also define how this new habitat will be created, whether those 10% need to be all in one clump of habitat or scattered in different fragments, or whether we need to create a corridor to allow species to move through the landscape. Another advantage of this approach is that as more data come in or as priorities change, we can adjust the the, this, this threshold up or down. We don't have to stay with this number forever. So, if we are successful in creating networks of, of native habitat through farmland, then something amazing is going to happen in 20 years because we're going to dramatically reduce the impact of climate change on species and on us as well. First, because we'll be sequestering a very large amount of carbon from the atmosphere. So in the Atlantic forest, the estimate is that um, by restoring priority areas, we're going to be sequestering about 1 billion tons of CO2. And this will help mitigate uh, global warming, but it will directly benefit species as well. And this is because the climate has always changed in the past and species have always ad adapted to a changing climate. But in past events, they also had continuous habitat to move through. The, the main problem now is that um, uh, there's so much fragmentation of habitats and species cannot move through the landscape anymore. So if we can restore um, the, the landscape and if we can store a, a large amount of habitat within farmland, 
and across many areas of the world, then we can increase habitat connectivity and we can create the right amount of habitat for these species as they reach a better climate. And we don't only help species. I mean, we can improve ecosystem services for farmers and urban people alike as we increase water security or filter air pollution. We can create green spaces where people can reconnect to nature and this will have a dramatic effect on mental health. And we can provide an economic safety net for farmers who are dealing with the uncertainties of a new climate. But there are only advantages to this approach. As the UK leaves the EU, um, it will end the basic payment scheme, which was under the pillar one of the common agricultural policy. And this was about 2.6 billion pounds that used to be paid to farmers according to the size of the land they own. And will in future be paid in a way that incentivizes farmers to restore and improve the environment within their land. So we have the means and opportunity to implement a similar system into practice now. We just need to change our mindset. And I hope I have convinced you that we can preserve species uh, while feeding an ever larger human population. But the approach I presented today is a pragmatic one. We can't save all species and we can't rewild the whole planet but we can dramatically reduce our impact on biodiversity and we can preserve the environment for our children. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions now. Christina, thank you so much. Um, I especially enjoyed the discussion on restoring habitat within farmland and that kind of balance. Um, so I have a couple of questions that have come in uh, from the audience ahead of the event, but I know that we also have a question that has come in today. So the first one is, do you think that all the benefits of nature have been fully discovered yet? And if not, then what might be new ways that we can see nature start supporting us? That is a, a really good question. Um, no, I think we're just scratching the surface of all the services that nature could provide for us. And this is because we often forget that we are part of nature. We evolved during for millions of years with a natural environment. And we don't even know what could be done. So for instance, um, it's very difficult to know what, you know, what is it that we don't know. But I suspect that the next, next revolution will be um, regarding the microbiome. So for instance, there are studies showing that species, people who live in farms have more bacteria, a higher diversity of bacteria in their skin, and they are less likely to develop um, asthma or, or allergies. And, and there, are a, there are a very large number of studies at the moment uh, talking about gut microbiome and how they can impact mental health and autoimmune diseases. And all of this will be coming from the environment around us. So this, I, I think what we will find next is that we've modified our world in a way that it's probably leading us to have a poorer health. Mm. And then from one of, the, one of the questions that came in from Gerard Greg Smith, he asked, can you give examples of wild non-microbe species we don't like, which are environmentally important? Non-microbes, well, um, yes, um, it, and it's a funny one because, um, for instance, we have evolved with parasites and, um, you know, through millions of years we've had parasites and now we have a much high, more hygienic environment, we can avoid having parasites, except that some parasites actually help us um, um, avoid uh, developing autoimmune diseases. So it's the sort of thing that um, maybe a hookworm here or there wouldn't be that bad. So it's, it's complicated, but we, we don't know yet all of the, the, the species. There is um, another question that's come in from, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name incorrectly, uh, Joao Rodriguez, who asks, how do you approach governments to take a look at research and act upon it? Is it through lobbying via international organizations like WWF or what, what is the way? Um, so the way that this happened was through a think tank in Brazil. Mm. Um, it wasn't me, myself, individually knocking on the um, Ministry of Environment's door. 
Um, so yes, it does need a lot of interaction. And I confess that this all happened also in the last um, um, in the last government that Brazil had. That was a very close interaction between um, academics and the Ministry of Environment. So you need to have the 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 governments somehow willing to listen. But um, many of them are willing. It's just that um, you need someone to make that hook. And I think we'll, we'll have time for one more question and then we'll move on. So do you imagine urbanism playing a bigger role in conservation in the future? If so, then in what way? This is a very difficult question. I would say yes and no. Um, no, because I don't think um, that um, urban, that uh, native habitat within urban environment is the place to preserve species. And it's, there's too much pressure from humans. And if we want to preserve species, we need some place for them to, to, to be a bit more protected. On the other hand, um, I think that there are, there's a lot that um, um, creating um, more habitat within urban environments can help us. So for instance, it could reduce flooding, it could reduce um, a number of other um, problems that we have, um, and it could allow people to, again, reconnect to nature. And, and it's so important to have this ability to walk in a, in a green area, and this will have a huge effect on, on mental health. Great. Thank you so much, Christina. And everyone remember that there are still chances to ask Christina more questions. We'll have questions uh, at the roundtable discussion as well. So please send some through. And in the connection to sensing and quantifying data, we now have our next academic speaker, Dr. Farad Guder, who's passionate about low cost yet sophisticated sensors. He has worked on a wide array of applications um, from soil wellness to actually COVID response and works with many startups under his supervision. Dr. Fred Guder is a senior lecturer in Faculty of Engineering and I'm really excited for him to share his vision with you today on the future of sensors. Welcome Fred. Hi everyone. Um, here is my dream for the future. I would like to live in a world in which diseases are detected so early that they could be cured with simple interventions, increasing our lifespan and helping communities come out of poverty. I want to live in a world where we have the capacity to communicate directly with the plants and soil so that we can provide the exact nutrients they need for growing crops eliminating our, our impact on the environment. I want to see a civilization that has a food system that's monitored so precisely that it produces zero waste so that every single calorie we put in to create these foods end up in our stomachs. These are not some dystopian Hollywood science fiction. All these dreams are possible with the use of frugal, low cost yet high performance sensors, which would allow us to measure anything and everything at any time. In 2007, with the release of um, the original iPhone, iPhone 2G, there were approximately 10 million mobile sensors being shipped across the globe. By 2013, this number increased by three orders of magnitude, by 1,000 times, to 10 billion mobile sensors being shipped and deployed. By 2019, we were shipping around approximately 1 trillion mobile sensors. And we expect that by, 2020, by 2030, there will be 100 trillion mobile sensors being shipped and deployed across the globe. 100 trillion is 100 followed by 12 zeros. It's an enormous number. These increases in the price of, in the, in the numbers of uh, uh, mobile sensors have been driven and have been fueled by their price. For example, in 2007, the accelerometer that was used in the original iPhone 
costed approximately $1.50. Accelerometer is the sensor that allows your screen to flip when you turn it sideways, that, that counts your steps, and really it's one of these sensors that, make your, that makes your sensor, uh, that makes your um, smartphone smart. A significantly more advanced version of the sensor now costs only 25 cents. A six fold drop in price and substantial increase in performance and capability. Just over a time of uh, uh, 13 years. Of course, you might be asking yourself, well, why do I care? Why does this matter to me? The first answer is obvious. We will simply pay less for technology and the data generated using this technology will be cheaper. However, the second answer to this question is less obvious. As the sensors get cheaper and cheaper, we will start placing them in places where we thought, where we thought uh, possible. For example, in our beds, pillows, on animals, on our bicycles, infrastructure, you name it. And then we can collect data and gain insights into what's happening at an entirely new scale. In my group, our goal is to create high performance, yet state of the art, high performance, low cost, state of the art sensing technologies and push the envelope towards near zero cost sensing. We just want to do a lot more for a lot less so that we can eat, feel, and live better. The sensors we develop range from thread-like sensors that are sewn into everyday clothes to near zero cost printed sensors for monitoring food spoilage. We produce a variety of sensors to solve uh, different problems. However, our main goal is to create low cost sensors so that we can connect the world around us with machines to solve problems mainly around health, food, and sustainability. Pre-COVID-19, you could just walk into a supermarket and pick up whatever food that you need. This was a dream come true for our civilization. Endless amounts of food and in a large uh, variety. As a civilization, we have sp spent enormous resources to make sure that we never go hungry. However, with COVID-19, it became obvious to everyone that this system is not a perfect system. It's fragile, it has many inefficiencies, and it produces a lot of waste. So the colorful scene that you see here is a bit of a misleading image. A third of all food that we produce gets wasted or lost across the globe. If we were to rank food waste in terms of, the, in terms of carbon, carbon dioxide emissions, it would be the lar third, largest, uh, uh, third, third largest emitter of carbon dioxide in the world after China and the US. In fact, 10% of all greenhouse gases are emitted due to food waste. There are many reasons behind why we produce so much food waste. However, one of the significant causes is the concept and the use of use by dates. You have all seen use by dates printed on packaging especially in, in, in retail stores. What used, used by dates are, uh, uh, they are conservative estimates of how long or until when a product could be consumed safely. They are static, they do not change. For example, if you buy a, a product from a fridge in a store, you leave it on, 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 uh, on the counter at home, the static, the static date does not change. They are conservative. That means that there's a huge margin for error. In fact, 30% of food, all food that's been, are perfectly good to eat. 
which means they are completely wasted. Even though the use-by dates are conservative, there are still 1 million hospitalizations per year in the UK alone due to food poisoning. This results in at least 1.5 billion pounds in healthcare costs. Tens of thousands of people, uh, tens of thousands of people also, um, um, uh, also suffer long-term effects and several hundred people die from food poisoning. There's something we can do to radically change this. Paper sensors. This is probably the least sexy slide you will see, but paper sensors are inexpensive, yet surprisingly high performance printed gas sensors that are created using ordinary cellulose paper and some conductive ink. These sensors can monitor food spoilage and replace the static used by these with dynamic information. When food, such as fish, spoils, it generates gases due to microbial activity. Paper sensors allow detection of these gases and produce an electrical signal that enable non-destructive monitoring of spoilage in real time. The counterintuitive idea behind this technology is the following. If we take a piece of paper, let's say copy paper, although it feels and looks dry, it's, it is always wet. This is due to the, to the chemical properties of cellulose, the main constituent of, of paper. Cellulose absorbs moisture from the environment and creates a wet substrate that seems, uh, that appears to be dry. The implication of this is that without ever adding a drop of water, to a piece of paper, we can actually do wet chemistry with it, which could be exploited to sense spoilage gases electrically. Paper sensors cost less than 2p per device, and this is for the laboratory prototypes. They could be made a lot cheaper at, at much higher volumes using industrial technologies. These sensors, once again, consists of nothing but conductive ink and cellulose paper. Of course, you might be thinking, well, if you have an electrical sensor that's inserted inside a packaging, you would need a reader, right? Well, yes and no. We were able to take the paper sensors and then hack them into a low-cost near-field communication tag. Near, near field communication tags are the same technology as, as, in, uh, as, in the, as in the technology used in Oyster cards and contactless payment cards. And now you can actually just take your smartphone, tap it onto a tag and determine whether a food item is good to eat or not. Last year, Reuters came to our lab and made the segment that I would like to share with you describing the technology. When there's so much of it on show, the temptation to buy too much food is very real. And once it's gone past its sell-by date, it often ends up in one of these, even though it's actually safe to eat. Scientists in London think they have the answer to stop this happening. Using your smartphone, you'll soon be able to find out if the food in your fridge has gone off based on the gases coming out of it. I would never have thought of that we would go this far. Um, but now that everything works, it actually looks like uh, there's going to be a, a great impact. And we can bring it from the lab, where it works really well, to, um, to the industry and have retailers and customers use our technology. The paper-based electrical gas sensors have been developed here at Imperial College London. They're made by printing carbon electrodes onto cellulose paper. They contain what are called near-field communication tags and microchips. That means information on the gases it's detecting can be read by your mobile phone. The beauty of it, obviously, is the, the simplicity. Um, we use paper, everyday paper, and just print uh, an ink on it, and then we can measure gases. The sensors cost about two cents each to make, and the developers say supermarkets could be using them on food packaging within three years. 
the interesting thing about this 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 video segment was that I was interviewed also quite a bit. However, I was not included at all in this segment. I guess I'm just not good looking enough for TV. Anyways, to make real impact and to create the future that we dream, my laboratory has been heavily involved in translational activities. Leveraging the, leveraging the network of Imperial and together with my students, to date, I have co-founded four companies based on my research. One of these startups, Black Bear, is, is currently commercializing the spoiler sense, sensing technology that I have described. They're a great team and they have already arranged pilots with, with large producers. Black Bear is focusing on integrating wireless spoiler sensors, both in disposable packaging so this is mainly targeting uh, retailers and, and food producers, as well as reusable packaging, commonly used by, by consumers, such as the one uh, shown here, which is in the format of, of Tupperware. Of course, when we generate large amounts of seemingly unrelated data, privacy will be a, will be a concern, and rightfully so. And we also hear a lot about how things can go wrong uh, in the news. However, when done right, if the industry and the policymakers, if they come together and agree, agree on the rules, we can make the information age powered by sensors safe and secure for everyone. If we're not careful, however, there is no limit to how, how, how bad things can go. So we might exercise caution as sensors start populating all around us. In the future, we will have low-cost sensors everywhere, driving the information age. With ubiquitous sensing, we will make better decisions using the invisible patterns in the data. And we will make sense of the world around us at a fundamentally deeper level. These deeper insights will lead to dramatic improvements in our health, society, and environment, allowing us to create a more sustainable, resilient, and healthier future. However, as academics, we cannot do this alone. Please do come help us to turn these ideas into reality. We're always on the lookout for partners from the industry, academia, uh, government, non-government, and philanthropic organizations to work on these challenging problems. Of course, I'm not doing all this work myself. In fact, most of it is done by my students, by my team. So I would like to thank them. They do all the hard work, hard work and I generally just take the credit for it. There is something you can do today, maybe not all of you, but some of you, that could actually help reduce food waste. If you have an old fridge, such as the one shown here, this is my fridge, often there's a mysterious dial inside. And this dial has, a, a, has, a, has numbers printed on it, ranging from zero to 10 or one to seven and so on. What this dial does is that it sets the temperature inside your fridge. However, it's not clear what the temperature is by looking at the numbers. Your goal is to make your fridge as cold as possible without freezing the things inside. When I read about this, that most fridges in, in, in the world are not kept, kept at, the, at, the, at the correct temperature, I actually placed a thermometer inside my fridge and measured the temperature and it was eight degrees. And it was, four, it was set to four. And then I dialed the number to one, it actually increased a little bit more. So only the temperature dropped to approximately four degrees when I set it to seven. So please go ahead. If you have an old fridge like mine, try to find the optimum temperature. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Uh, I will definitely make sure to check my fridge out. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm at home, so it's a perfect thing to do after this session. Um, 
And I hope the rest of the audience does as well to make sure that we don't produce even more food waste. So we've had a couple of questions from the audience both beforehand and now. So um, I'll get started on them. So um, the first one is with regards to the kind of um, food waste um, or food sensing products uh, from Black Bear. Do you see, where do you see these going first? Is this something that we would use ourselves to monitor our own food or is it something that will be initiated by big supermarkets like Tesco? How would it work? Um, although, so Black Bear think, thinks that both of them could work. However, the accelerated route will likely be through food producers and potentially retailers because mm -hmm. they are really feeling the pain that they throw away food and it cuts into their, in, in cuts into their profits. So there is a, a massive incentive to, um, to fix, this, fix this problem. Of course, there's also an incentive for, for consumers to, to, to fix this problem as well. I mean, if we go, we go and, and, and buy products, and then we don't consume and we just throw them away. Um, however, um, it just takes a bit of, it, it just takes a bit more time um, for, consumers, for consumers to get used to, get used to a new technology. So um, initially, Black Bear is likely going to try to uh, work with, with food producers and, and retailers, but and then as the technology matures, it will find also, also its way to, 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 to consumers like you and I. Great. So we had a live question from the audience as well um, that asked, can the sensors be designed to pick up um, just, so let's see, just specific um, gases or is it, and because you talked about ammonia, is there anything else that they can be designed to pick up? Yeah, sure. Um, so we are working on, 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 on technologies at the moment. Uh, to increase the specificity of the of the of the sensors, and uh, recently um, we have also been approached by the by the U.S. Army to uh, to look into this. And um, for food waste applications, we don't really need too much specificity because all we really want is to see that in in fact there is microbial activity and there is increased microbial activity. But for some other applications, for example, we, do apl we apply the same technology or similar technology for detecting kidney disease. There, we need, we need more specificity. So, uh, and that's a technology that we're currently developing. And, and in fact, we applied for, for human testing, uh, um, which, was gonna, which, which it was supposed to happen uh, uh, right before everything shut down. So it's not clear when that's going to uh, start again, but, um, Yes, it is possible to, to increase specificity with these sensors by, by adding chemical modifications to, to, to paper. Fantastic. And a quite, quite different question, but something that also it came in beforehand, uh, before the session. So in terms of the supply chain, how do you imagine that changing with these new um, low-cost sensors? Um, supply. So one of the things that we found out was that, for example, fish. Fish gets shipped around all over the world. And most customers think that if a product is shipped by plane, it's safer and it's, it's of higher freshness, therefore of higher quality. When we talked to the industry insiders, they said that the products, fish products that are shipped by large vessels tend to be fresher because although it takes longer because it's not allowed to place ice on cargo planes so there they put small pouches to, to keep things cold and they don't last that long and so on and then also at the airports luggage people's luggage uh, uh, they are usually prioritized and cargo kind of comes next in line so Oftentimes, uh, uh, the slower sh shipping resulted in better quality and less spoiled foods. However, we were told that they just couldn't convince, they just couldn't convince their customers. So 
these kind of sensors would um, really be the proof that in fact a seemingly uh, a slower and 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 um, and 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 an even cheaper method may actually work uh, much better than a faster and more expensive uh, uh, way to ship ship products around. So this is um, this I thought was uh, uh, an interesting thing that I was told uh, a couple of months ago. And and other than this, of course, you know, if we if we monitor the chemistry of the things that are being shipped around, mm. again, if we look at the, the if we look at fish, you know, not if we take two different fish from, from the same sea, they will have different microbiomes, they will spoil differently, et cetera. So just maintaining temperature at a set uh, point is not enough. So we really need to, to, to monitor the chemistry. And if we monitor the chemistry, then we can start behaving differently and then reduce, then reduce waste. That's fantastic. So in essence, your, your sensors can help us almost reinvent the supply chain and how we currently ship our products and food across the world. To not break exactly. Fantastic. I have um, a couple of further questions here. So one is about what about disease? I've heard COVID has a specific smell. Yeah, we have we have not we have not looked into this yet. So uh, I, I I've also heard that um, uh, dogs are being being used to to smell to smell out COVID. Um, yeah. We do we do work with dogs. We work with with sniffer dogs for for detecting explosives. Uh, um, however, we have not looked into detecting, uh, uh, using sniffer dogs for, for detecting diseases. Uh, in any case, so smelling out COVID is not something we have done. But you were still, still engaged within COVID response at Imperial, right? Do you want to tell a little bit about that work? Sure. Um, so we have developed a, um, a sensing technology that miniaturizes the conventional method that's used for detecting COVID uh, uh, or, the, or the pathogen that, that causes COVID-19 um, with, a, with, a with a very small device. So um, the conventional way of detecting uh, SARS-CoV-2 is by taking a swab and then putting it inside a machine and really check for its presence. And this whole process is called uh, PCR. So we, this method involves detecting the, the, the genetic material from the, the virus itself. So when this crisis started emerging, we were just at the end of finishing a project funded by the Wellcome Trust for detecting infectious diseases in animals. And uh, um, with, with minor modifications, we started working on uh, applying the same technology or, or, or at least a, a repurposed version of it to a um, to detecting to detecting COVID, this is still uh, a work in progress. Uh, however, it's it's very promising. Fantastic. We only have I think we have one more question that we can take from the audience, um, and then we'll, we're going to have to move on. But I I will tell the audience again, please do ask questions because we might be able to answer more questions in the roundtable a bit later. So there is one question here that says, if the use by date passed by day one, what do you do? Do you eat it after smelling it? If the use yes, by date sensor. is <laughs> sorry. You don't have your sensors, of course. So it says that if the use by date yeah. passed by one day, what do yeah. you do? Do you eat yeah. after, after smelling it? Okay. Um, well, I mean, I can I can speak for myself. I always like I basically disregard the use by date unless it's past you know, like a couple of weeks. And yeah, I do I do tend to smell, and then um, and then if it smells okay, it's fine. And then if it's a meat product, um, I smell it after I cook it because, uh, so my father's a veterinarian and then he told me that if it's gone really bad, the smell will still be there after, after you cook it. And that's worked out okay for me until, until now. I mean, I, 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 especially vacuum sealed products and, 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 and products that have a modified atmosphere, um, they can last a really long time. So, um, for example, um, I buy yogurt um, and uh, I leave it in my office at room temperature and it 
I leave it out, you know, past couple of a couple of weeks even use by date, and it was, it's been kind of okay until now. I've, I've never been sick, so however, I cannot recommend. I cannot recommend this. I don't. I can't. We are can't not the much. health authorities. <laughs> I am not. I am not the health authority. I mean, you know, I do it, but uh, I cannot recommend that you do too. So, in fact, actually, this brings us to a, a good point, which is probably in the in the short term, we will not try to change with with these technologies. We will not try to change. The, the use by date completely. It would just come in as a complementary technology. Mm -hmm. And then as it gets proven more, because, and the reason for that is because there's a lot of legislation around use by date, tech, as, around use by date. So, um, it, so whatever we produce, it'll be very difficult to change completely the system that already exists. So we have to kind of grow into it slowly and slowly and build confidence. And then hopefully sooner or later, uh, uh, with with the massive advantages of these new uh, new technologies, and, uh, we will start adopting them. I think when when organizations see the kind of financials that they can get from this in terms of not throwing away food as well, they'll start. It's almost going back to Christina's discussion around the balance between um, conservation and profit. And I guess it's the same thing here. When you see the profit you can make or the, um, the gain you can make by not throwing away this massive amount of food, then, um, then it becomes a bigger incentive. That's, that's very true. I mean, if, so one thing that I have realized is that, especially in terms of food, if only one party is winning, the technology will not get adopted. Yeah. Everybody throughout the whole system almost uh, uh, has to win for a technology to get adopted and, and deployed and used and, and become a success. So in fact, it's just, it, it, it is very true what Christina said. I think that's a great end to this uh, Q&A. Thank you so much, Fred. It's been really interesting. Again, audience, please do add, uh, add further questions. Our next speaker will share her research on the subject of ethical business. Professor Celia Moore is the Professor of Organizational Behavior at the Business School. And in today's talk, she will share her research on how we can become ethical leaders during a time of uncertainty. I would like to welcome Celia to, to share her screen. Uh, thank you for having me, Maria, and thank you for everyone who has uh, stuck with us for this whole webinar. I know it's a long time and all of us spend a lot of time staring at screens, so I appreciate you sticking with me. Um, I am probably, I'm the least scientifically trained speaker of any of the speakers that have come. Um, I study human behavior, which is by nature very unscientific, and I think the reason um, why I'm especially pleased to be presenting today is that when I got asked to join a session on meta motivations, um, the question that arises in terms of my own research is, does morality motivate us? And I started thinking about um, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, Maslow was a, was a theorist um, about 100 years ago, and he was um, designed a, a critical way of understanding how humans are motivated. So lots of you would know about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It starts with physiological needs and then safety needs and then belonging needs and then esteem needs and then self-actualization. And that's normally where it stops. And that was his first sort of go at an understanding of a hierarchy of human needs that he developed in 1943. Um, what we don't, it was not often shared or often known is that in the 60s, he actually started asking himself the question, okay, so if we live in a society where people can self-actualize, what happens then? And he, he introduced a sixth stage in the hierarchy, um, which almost no one knows about. And so for him, the ultimate motivation, the ultimate human motivation was actually morality. And I have, I have, a, I have a, something to a quote from him because it was so relevant to our talk today. Um, he wrote that the fully developed and very fortunate human being working under the best conditions tends to be motivated by values which transcend his self or herself, but he wrote his. Um, and, and that he called at actually in 1969, a meta-motivation. Meta so meta-motivated people, which is so perfect for today's talk, are people who are motivated by morality. 
So this is, this is what I've studied for the last 15 years. And I, I decided to arrange this talk around two things, two sort of um, uh, social crises that are providing um, uh, real foci for how we are motivated right now. The Black Lives Matter movement and COVID. And the reason why I think they're important is because uh, the question of what ethical leaders do is help um, their employees and the people that respond to them meet their human needs. Now, for lots of people, those can be sort of needs farther down on Maslow's hierarchy. So are you as a leader helping make sure that your employees are um, physiologically safe, right? Um, then are you making sure that they're safe from violence or sickness? Then are you helping them belong? And that's where I'll start with my first, I'm screen sharing, oh, there we go. Um, my first question. I've got two questions that I'll answer today um, with reference to my own research. And the first one is, in an age of polarization, how do we make others feel included? So it's really clear in, in most countries that polarization of um, political and social views is becoming more extreme and more dangerous. Um, this exacerbates tensions in a way that leads to violence and unrest and unhappiness and disengagement. Um, so it really is the job of the people who are managing our largest organizations and our small organizations to make people feel included. This isn't being done right now and I'll help sort of explain what we as individuals can do to help this. So I'm gonna tell you about a quick study that I ran right before the US presidential election. Um, and it has to do with people feeling, what, when people feel unsafe, what happens? So before the 2016 presidential elections, um, we asked uh, several hundred people to engage in a really simple economic game where they had to um, allocate resources to three other people that were in their group. And we varied whether those people were a member of their in-group or a member of their out-group. So we had first asked them much before what their political orientation was, and then we asked them to make these allocations. And what we see in the week before the presidential election, when it was, when all the polls were calling for um, Hillary Clinton, the Democrat, to win, um, that Republicans were showing in-group favoritism. So that higher bar on the left there in a group with three Republicans is that Republicans in groups um, would, would allocate much more um, to the others in their group if those others shared their political view. The bars on the left are how Democrats um, allocated resources to members of their group, and, and it's easy to see that they allocated um, the resources in those groups much more equally. Now, one of the reasons for this is that Democrats at the time felt safe. They felt more certain and safe that their, um, their vision of the future would be, would be realized. Um, we didn't realize this at the time because it was before the election, but the election did not turn out like this. And so the week after the election, we uh, surveyed the same group of people to see how they were feeling. And in the week after the election, you can see here that negative emotions of all types ran really high for Democrats. So Democrats were more hostile, more suspicious, more paranoid, more angry, more cynical, more depressed, more fearful, and had more dread um, than Republicans. This put them in a state of fear. And fear is one of the, is a really deep seated motivator, but not a highly um, value based motivator. It tends to make us um, uh, hunker down and treat our in group better than our out group. So then we made the, the participants do the same kind of allocation exercise that they did right before the election. And what you can see is the tables had turned. All of a sudden, um, Democrats wanted to penalize Republicans. So if you look on the, on the bars on the right, um, you can see that in, for Democrats, if they were in a group with one Democrat and two Republicans, they treated the Republicans very badly. They gave them hardly any allocation at all. Whereas because Republicans had been made to feel safe, they could treat everybody um, more equally. 
They still treated themselves a little bit better, but in general, they got more egalitarian. What I think is nice about this very sort of simple economic game is that it shows you how much our treatment of others, especially others who do not share our values or identities or orientations to the world, shifts as a function of how safe or certain we feel. And that leads us to, leads me to, to want to tell you about, um, uh, oh yeah, so, I'll go back to that, something called the circle of moral regard. So this, this, uh, this idea that we treat people differently as a function of how broadly we construe the um, agents to whom we owe a moral duty um, was, was sort of first came to the fore right after the Holocaust. And there were two anthropologists who studied um, what differentiated those who rescued others in the Holocaust from those who were bystanders. And they wanted to explain like what, what, what characterized the differences. Was it that they were more religious or that they were urban or that they were rural or that they were farmers or that they were educated or that they were, they looked at every possible thing. And they found that actually there was no differences that they could find that were sort of demographic or, or life history or religion um, that, that explained why some people became bystanders and other people became rescuers. What really differentiated these, the, the, these two groups of people is how expansive their circle of moral regard was. So when you see yourself as owing a moral duty to everybody else who's human on the planet, right? Your, your moral behavior is gonna be different than if you just think that you owe a, a more particular moral duty to yourself or members of your immediate family. When we have an expansive circle of moral regard, we can do things like make other people feel safe. So in the Black Lives Matter movement that's happened in the last two weeks, now I'm not saying that, that this picture represents um, anything truly generalized or um, anything more than a symbolic gesture. But what I think is really interesting in the news when you hear about some of the demonstrations in some American cities where police officers um, have been kneeling with the protesters rather than um, approaching them with riot gear and in military tanks, you can see how that kind of action would help the people around them feel safer, which allows us to be more generous to others. So the way of helping people function in a way that has an expansive um, circle of moral regard is to find ways to meet those very, very basic human needs that Maslow identified. How can we make the people around us feel like their, their physiological needs are gonna be met and that they are safe? And as soon as we start helping the people around us feel that way, their behavior will be more elevated. Um, I, 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 I was thinking about Dominic Cummings um, uh, in the last couple of weeks because he provided a nice segue to talk about COVID, but also an example of someone who in his um, uh, neglect to apologize for his breaking of lockdown rules with his family and rather providing an explanation what he was really doing in that, in that press conference was explaining that his circle of moral regard was very narrow. What mattered to him was his immediate family and not the population of the UK. So that, that was not a, a press conference that made people feel safe in the same way that um, people who make sacrifices in order to uh, demonstrate a moral duty to a broader range of people or species, right? We've talked about species, we've talked about plants um, today. We need to find ways of expanding our sphere of moral regard rather than limiting it. The second question that I've been thinking a lot about in the last couple months is in, in, in an age of uncertainty, how do we make others feel safe? And uh, there's the last three months have, um, have been, well, they keep using the word unprecedented, and that is certainly true, um, but what's been, what's been most uh, salient to me is how, how unsafe it feels. Um, so I was thinking about how do leaders make others feel safe? And, and for this, I wanted to um, tell you about another study that I'm doing um, in, in, a, in a way that can help 
anyone as an individual make small changes in their life that might help um, help on a broader scale eventually. So um, I study the role of humility in leadership effectiveness and how other people view their leaders. And uh, th this basically means two things. It means that leaders need to function in ways that diminish their own self-importance vis-a-vis um, -vis the importance that they show others. And here I have a, a picture of Pope Francis kissing the feet of refugees of all different religions, um, all different stripes of society, including people who were um, uh, felons or in prison before. This is a very different sort of leadership symbol than we've seen before in the Catholic Church. And it really um, telegraphs to the people who view Pope Francis as a leader that he is not important. What's important to him as a leader is serving the others around him. So diminished self-importance is, is a really important part. The other thing that, the second thing that's really important to, to humble and effective leadership is showing a heightened understanding of others. Now, Jacinda Ardern has been um, uh, uh, highlighted in the press several times um, for being a truly exceptional leader through, in, through the COVID crisis. This picture here is not in the COVID crisis, it's when there was a um, a mass shooting in a mosque in Christchurch in, um, in New Zealand, and a picture of her hugging someone who was affected by that tragedy. One of the things that she has been noted for and is consistently praised for is how much empathy she has for those around her. And that was consistently demonstrated in the types of speeches, very different from Dominic Cummings, um, in how she, she talked about everyone doing um, making the sacrifices that were necessary to get through COVID together. We need to do this together. There was a lot of we um, in that, in that, in the way that she was orienting her public messages. In turn, I think that made others feel safe. It allowed them to make more, um, more rapid and quick and extreme um, lockdown measures earlier on. And now we see that New Zealand has basically um, managed to get through this first wave of the COVID crisis with very few deaths and with, with a rapidly um, easier economy reopening than we will see in the UK or in the US. So how can you help others develop this capacity? Um, the paper that I wanted to, the research that I wanted to tell you about just before I end is a paper that I'm writing right now about the role of reading literature in leadership effectiveness. This work came out of um, an observation um, when Barack Obama was leaving office. I know that my accent sounds American, but in fact, I am Canadian. I'm still interested in Obama as a leader um, who would annually um, share a list of, of books that had been really meaningful to him that year. He's a really avid reader in sort of contrast to the current US president. And it, uh, it got me thinking about whether reading literary fiction, literature, actually can make you a more effective leader. Could the causal direction move that way? So I, I thought about the way that, that books had, um, had affected me. Um, and there's a whole body of work in cognitive psychology about how literature affects your cognitions. But I think it's really interesting that, that literature can do th two things. One, it helps you develop an understanding that you are not the main character in the universe. You are not the one of central importance. You are not the narrator. You're the narrator of your life, but there's a lot of other, other people with other narratives that are also important. Um, novelist George Eliot, many, several hundred years ago, wrote that literature is a mode of amplifying experience and extending our contact with our fellow men beyond the bounds of our personal lot. It was transcendent in the same way that Maslow talked about beyond self-actualization, our meta-motivation is a transcendent set of values. Um, Sing on Buried Sing, which is a beautiful novel by Jesmyn Ward, talks about many, um, several generations of uh, families in the American South that are very impoverished and have been imprisoned and have drug addiction. And reading that book gave me a real sense of what it would be like to be imprisoned in the American South in the 1930s. Now, that's an experience that I could never otherwise have really deeply, except through reading a beautiful um, description of it in, in literature. So I, I posited that it helps people reduce their sense of self-importance. 
The other thing it does is create an intimate understanding of others. Now in cognitive psychology, there's research that shows that we have both neurological and physiological responses to literature, um, demonstrating that we embody the, the feelings of the people that we're reading. We actually take on those emotions and show um, through sensors that they use when you're reading that your heart rate goes up if you read something scary, um, uh, and that your, the parts of your brain light up that have to do with empathy if you're reading about someone in pain. This gives us a real understanding of what others experience. So Mr. Loverman, which is another um, book I've read recently, um, that, that well-dressed looking man on the cover is a Caribbean immigrant to London who's in his 70s, he's gay, um, he's a father, he's, um, uh, yeah. I am not, I'm not gay, I'm not from the Caribbean, I'm not black, I'm not 70 and I'm not gay. So I don't have a lot in common with Mr. Loverman in most other ways, um, but when I read that book, I could experience what he did. I saw the world through his eyes, giving me this intimate understanding of others. And so I've, I've conducted a series of studies, including experiments that allow me to tease out causality that can show that um, with, with, with dyads of supervisors and subordinates who, who rate each other, I, I can show that leaders, supervisors who report that they read more literature are perceived by their subordinates as being more humble and as being better leaders. And I've even done this experimentally where I've had groups of um, participants in psychology experiments read either passages from um, a piece of literature or from a memoir and then get them to write a speech as if they're a leader. And what's really interesting is if all you had to do was read 20 pages of either a memoir or a piece of literature, and we can show that the people who read literature and then wrote a speech as a leader use twice as many, wait, people who read literature use half as many I words and twice as many we words in those speeches as those who read literature. So there's something about the experience of reading literature that, that changes our perspective on humanity in a way that expands our circle of moral regard, um, in a way that it increases other people's attributions of, of leadership to us and make us more effective leaders that can actually um, uh, lead in a way that meets that meta motivation of a transcendent moral value. So I know that this was a slightly different presentation, um, but I appreciate your attention and hopefully um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Hi Celia, thank you so much. Um, we had a couple of questions. I think firstly, it was really extreme, it was really interesting to hear how we can practice our own ethical leadership simply by starting to read more. By imagining, our, imagining ourselves in other people's shoes through, through books, which is something that we all can think about now as we're staying at home more. So I have a couple of questions that have come in from the audience both before and, um, and now. So the first one is, uh, can we really define what ethical is? Isn't the concept continually evolving? So um, this is a question that I've had a chance to think a lot about and I think in some ways, uh, focusing too much on how the, the concept of what's ethical is evolving absolves us of responsibility for thinking about what, what, what the true moral values that underpin societies are. And what, what really changes actually is how broad one circle of moral regard is. You go back to the Greeks and, and they had the same kind of, of moral values two main ones, against harming others and uh, to treat people fairly. Now, the Greeks engaged in slavery, so they defined their circle of moral regard as the Greeks were owed better moral behavior than anyone who wasn't Greek, right? So for me, what really changes is how that sphere of moral regard is conceived rather than the moral values themselves. Great, so we had a question come in from the audience during the talk and it's from Ray Shaw and he asks, can morality be quantified, preferably in monetary terms so that economists can include this in their assessments? I can guess what you will answer to this. <laughs> you know, I, another, another project that I'm working on right now is the moral problems with quantification. 
Um, and it's not, you know, I'm a social scientist. I quantify things. I do empirical research that, you know, it's not that I'm against numbers. I, I, what I worry about, right, which is why that's a really tricky question, mm. is the things that are easier to quantify, we value more because they can go in a spreadsheet more easily and we can sort them and it can seem like the most important ones are at the top. And at the end of the day, you know, when all of, when you do studies of people at end of life and you talk about what's important, it's never the stuff that's easily quantified. Mm. So um, while I wish it were true, um, I would encourage people to think more deeply about the things that are difficult to quantify and how they should play into our decisions. Um, even though they're not going to be the ones that are as attractive immediately because we can put them in Excel. Great. So we had another question come in uh, from Mike Tennant. And he says that Maslow is very much perceived as being associated with individualism. Isn't it better to frame ethical leadership in a philosophy that has more external focus, such as virtue ethics, communitarianism, and rules? Oh, wow. Someone who knows their philosophy. Um, so, I mean, the reason why I, why I thought that Maslow was an interesting person to talk about at the beginning is, is because he actually called moral values a meta motivation. So that sort of played right into the theme. <laughs> um, and, and actually his work later on um, was much less individualistic. Mm. It, it, what he said was once you can self-actualize, because humans are pretty, you know, we are pretty self-oriented, especially when we're having our needs at the bottom of that hierarchy mat. We care about ourselves and our family having enough to eat before we care about other people having stuff to eat. And that's a very evolutionary, you know, that's an evolutionary drive that we need to respect. Mm. But when we live in a society that has enough for everybody to eat or to, you know, we need to think in more transcendent ways. And so this sixth um, stage in the hierarchy was exactly about transcendent values that go beyond the individual. Um, and that's exactly how we talked about it. Fantastic. And then we had another one, which will be the, the last one uh, before we, we move on. So that is, can you share examples of ethical leaders in business today? Has anyone surprised you positively or negatively during the COVID crisis? Oh, <laughs> um, I mean, people have surprised me both ways in the COVID crisis. <laughs> um, one of the things that I have found really interesting is there, there are some leaders who are have really prioritized their stakeholders, who have made sure that their um, employees are safe, made sure that you know and the that whatever extra money there is goes into supporting their business and making sure that employees lower down are safe. And there have been other people who have done the exact opposite, right? One of the things that I encourage leaders to think about is is that they are actually creating their legacies now. When we're in a period of uncertainty, what people want to do is hunker down and protect self, mm. which is why a lot of people are like, okay, we'll put everyone on furlough. We're going to, you know, and it, that becomes very self-focused. Um, but there are, there are, and, and suddenly I'm blanking on all of them. Um, several organizations have really put their employees first. So for example, uh, I got, a, I get Okada delivery. I have always loved Okada and I like them even more now. And when I ask the people who come and deliver um, how they're doing and how they're keeping safe, one of, the, one of the delivery men recently said, you know, I've only worked at Okada for two months, but it's the first place I've ever worked where they actually cared about my mental health. And I've never heard someone really low down in, a, in an organizational hierarchy talk so passionately about an employer that way. Mm. So I do think there's a really wide variance. When we are under threat, it is almost an evolutionary drive for us to behave selfishly. But if we can behave transcendently, that is what will get us through this crisis. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And if, you, if anyone has any further questions, we have, we're going to have a very short roundtable discussion. Uh, welcome back, um, Christina, Farad, and Celia, for this very short roundtable discussion. We have received quite a few questions that concern all of the talks. And we will uh, try to get through as many as possible where we know we only have 10 minutes left. Um, and so to begin with, this is an event about the future. And I really wanted to hear about your thoughts. And let's try to paint a positive future. So 
What are some of the positive signals of change um, in the fields that you work in that you would really like to highlight that you haven't mentioned in your talks today? So I'll start with you, Christina. <laughs> Do you know want to start? Do you want to pass it over? <laughs> I'm not sure I have that many positive <laughs> ideas for the future. Um, it, is, it is very challenging. I think we are experiencing a very challenging time um, with, um, with actually, in, in many cases, people understand the importance of preserving the environment, but are not making real uh, steps towards doing it. So in a way, I think that um, this pandemic has given us an idea that we will have to change our behavior. And it is all down to changing behavior. Um, we, there's no amount of reforestation that we can do that will lead to, to that will stop climate change. We're going to have to change our behavior to such a drastic extent that it's probably similar to, in similar ways to what's happening during this pandemic. So, yeah, I, I think that um, in a way this, uh, what we're experiencing right now is giving us kind of like a way to the future of how we can change. And would you agree with that, Celia? You talked about the kind of positive and negative role models around the, <laughs> the COVID response. From, from well, the I mean, I think, so I, I, I teach in MBA programs about the intersection between ethics and leadership. So if I didn't believe that people couldn't and don't change for the better, I'd be in a really stupid profession. So I, I do deeply believe that we make moral progress. You know, we, we treat more people better now than we ever have before. Our circle of moral regard is greater than ever before. I used to make jokes in my MBA class that because it's so natural for humans to create in groups and out groups so that they can justify treating out groups badly, um, that we needed to, you know, get invaded by aliens. And then finally, as a human race, we could be one in group and just make them the out group. And I think that for me, the, the sort of opportunity that, that COVID presents itself is it's a really good out group, right? It's a really good, as a human race, we can come together and make that the bad guy. Um, so that's, that's the way in which I can, I can frame this positively. Do you have any positive signals of change in, in, that you see around your work, Brett? Um, yeah, definitely. I'm an optimist, right? I think, um, you know, I think although signals show a little bit that, you know, maybe the future generations in, 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 in some ways, I mean, in the U.S., for example, the, 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 um, the expected, uh, 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 expected age of age of death actually this this kind of decreased a little bit but in general things things are improving in in every single category so this has been kind of at the expense of 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 the environment but we're learning to deal with that too we are realizing that uh we need an optimum solution so um the, i think there are many things really one thing is that if we look at like my group works quite a bit in diagnostics, especially for the developing world. And um, in the past, I guess people were kind of like, well, why should I care? Sure, some people felt like, you know, making a donation or helping, it just makes us feel good, right? It's still like, you know, very self-focused. But um, it's become obvious that it's much more than that because we're so connected that we can no longer say whatever is happening there, it has no influence on me. You know, for example, the wars, the wars uh, that, that were going on in the, in the Middle East or, or in Africa and so on, there were the refugees coming, right? So it changed also, also the life here, again with the pandemic. It was a disease that happened somewhere else, but it just spread very quickly. So, um, and I think people have become um, very aware that we are in this together and we must help each other out. Um, and that creates a, a motivation for individuals and, 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 and governments and, and funders, let's say, to, uh, to support science more. Because you, know, you cannot even grow a tree properly without science. Like it's, 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 we, really need, we really need to in, invest in education and science. And 
it's just becoming more and more obvious uh, as a whole. So that's a that's a good thing. But that's a that's a more 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 broader, I think, answer. Um, probably a narrower answer is that interdisciplinary research is getting more recognition nowadays. So people realize that you need to kind of come out of push the boundaries, go and start take your skills in a certain area and try to apply it to in a, in a different field, and th that's getting you know, more acceptance. And I think that's a very good thing um, uh, for, for STEM, for sure, and other disciplines as well. Uh, and as we see, um, uh, you know, with Christina's talk again, uh, whatever research she, that she did, actually the outcome may not be as important if you don't go and then talk to policymakers, you know, so that they can go and start knocking on doors and, and then start making a real change in the field. So I think a couple of different things really are, are emerging that will be really um, uh, huge drivers of, of improvements in the future. This is really interesting, this idea of interconnectedness and really seeing that for what it is globally and, and addressing the, the need and uh, desire for science to make, to make, to make a change in that. Um, we, and in Christina's talk, she mentioned focusing on the next generation. So focusing on the future generations in order to conserve the, the forest and the nature that we have and um, to, to leave the world in a better place. Um, so, so Celia, what, what are the things that you aim <laughs> to leave in a better place for your, your children, if you would look at the future in that way? Um, an inclusive way of thinking, right? Um, there's a, I really, do think that uh, the COVID pandemic is providing an opportunity for a lot of people to think about what actually matters. We know from life course research that what people say matters at the end of life, that they wish that they'd known before, is not the things that have seemed important when you're in your 20s and 30s. Um, this pandemic has sort of forced us to, to think a lot more about what really, really is important. And it usually isn't the things that can be easily quantified. Um, and there are simpler pleasures that I think require a lot less, a lot fewer resources of the planet. Um, and how I think it's become a lot more obvious how if we don't all get together and behave more altruistically, we really aren't going to survive. So I think that has provided the opportunity for Black Lives Matter. I think that is why um, on every street I know of in London, there has been an altruistic outpouring of support for people's immediate neighbors, right? All of those actions are behavioral changes that have expanded that person's daily sense of to whom they owe a moral duty. And that provides me with a lot of optimism. Right, I think we, we have one question left and I want it just to be a very short question. And I wanted to ask all the panelists if they could recommend the audience, the wonderful audience we had today, one thing that they can do today to make a difference for, for the future. So, um, Firat, do you wanna go first? Sure. Um, I think, I think we need to self-educate. I think this is a, a critical thing that um, we always think that somebody should kind of come, <clears throat> come and train us and teach things. And we don't give us enough credit that we actually can learn things on our own. And um, because at the end of the day, uh, when I look at all the problems that we see nowadays, although the problems are systematic, but the origin is the, it is the individual. So, and that could only be overcome in my opinion through education. So we just need to self-educate and then, you know, recognize our shortcomings, recognize our biases, and then just try to deal with, with, uh, uh, with situations like that. So without solving the problem at the level of the individual, uh, I, I feel that it's going to be really difficult to, 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 uh, to change the future. What about you, Christina? What can we do? I think perhaps taking, uh, following from what Farad had said, I, I really love uh, Celia's, um, I can't remember exactly the word, but uh, that Venn diagram where you have the outer layer, the care for the environment and for the planet in a way where you have the self as the 
smaller circle. And I think I, I would say self-educating and trying to reach the awareness and the importance of the planet in, in a whole, as a whole, rather than just our species, or even less than that. Uh, so I would say two things super quick, read a great piece of literature and reach out to those around you, especially people who are unlike you and make them feel safe and included. Thank you so much. I think that was a great way to end the session today. I first want to thank our academic speakers. So thank you, uh, Dr. Christina banks Leiter, Dr. Fred Guder, Professor Celia Moore. You have really given us invaluable insight on how we might tackle uncertainty in this time in a more careful and purposeful manner and how we can lead by learning how to measure better and how to relate better to nature, essentially.